So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. May I ask for attention? We are ready to start this afternoon program. We apologize for a little delay as we were coming to downtown of Vancouver. There was a little traffic and one wrong turn and took us a little bit more time. However, we are pleased to see you here. And I would like to introduce the speaker for this hour. It is Dr. John Baer. Uh, he is a health practitioner from Denver, Colorado area, and we are very pleased that he has taken his time from a busy schedule to be with us today and to uh, share with us an important the lecture on important subject matter. The title of his presentation is Heart Under Attack. The health of the heart and cardiovascular system, uh, prevention of uh, heart diseases and so on will be the subject matter, and we are very happy that Dr. Baer is here, and I invite him to come forward. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so happy to be here with you in your beautiful city of Vancouver. It is truly a beautiful place. Uh, your traffic here is also quite... Uh, <laughs> challenging at times and I, we apologize for being just a little bit late uh, this afternoon. Haven't been to Vancouver often but as I think back uh, there was a time actually in 1976 that I when I got out of college my favorite and first choice city in which to settle and practice was Vancouver. So I actually came to your wonderful city and spent some time here looking around, but as I don't want to say fate would have it, but I ended up in Denver. It's a little more sunny there, but your city is beautiful. The, the, the nature, the trees, the vegetation is extremely appealing. And uh, one of my favorite places in Vancouver was Stanley Park. I think that's a great place to be. And I'm hoping that after today's lecture, we may also be committed to doing what we're seeing here on this picture. Maybe a little bit more of exercise, a little bit more walking around and engaging in the beauties of this city, a night view. And um, here's actually the building in which we find ourselves. A very beautiful city, lovely skyline, and you are a wonderful people. Thank you for taking the time to come here and be with us this afternoon. As we go through life, we find that there are certain things, certain things we see, certain things we hear that become indelibly imprinted in our minds and in our hearts. Sometimes they are tragic, sometimes they are as a consequence of tremendous loss, but usually these impressions stay with us forever. One I just formed yesterday as I was coming here to Vancouver. We all know what Denver has become famous for just in the last, shall we say, 48 hours. And on my way from the, uh, to the airport, I went past that shopping center that had no cars parked in it any longer that day. The entire shopping center was closed. The shopping center in which that cinema was located that was the side, the, 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 um, the site of those tragic murders. 71 people were shot at or were injured, and 12, the last I heard, were dead. And as we look at some of these things, and the flags were flying half-mast all through, the president declared half-mast for all flags in the United States. I thought of some other situations that if we go back just in our minds, not very far, just to January 13th of this year, as you look at this, does that bring something to your mind? Maybe this picture will help you. January 13th. A beautiful ship. Beautiful ship. It's kind of like your beautiful city. Setting out on a beautiful voyage. With people in it from all over Europe. Different countries in Europe. Planning for a good time. A destination vacation to relax and to enjoy. And something very simple, something very small took place that made a good day into a bad day. 
People got on board with anticipation, with excitement, with their luggage, with all of their belongings, only to depart looking like this, huddling in blankets with no longer any luggage. A voyage down the coast of Italy, a voyage that had been done many, many times before. The pilot had, the captain had done this trip many, many times before, very experienced. But something took place that ended up with the ship looking like that. These are images that portray what happened to the Costa Concordia. A beautiful ship, but a simple problem. A rock. Look at the size of that rock that became embedded in the side of the ship as a consequence of a mistake. A journey that started happily, joyfully, but took a course a little too close to the edge. You know, sometimes we like to live life on the edge, just a little bit too close to the edge. Hit rock, gash was cut into the ship, and many lives were lost. This picture here was taken just a few weeks ago as a salvage effort is now being begun to right this ship, but never to sail again. This ship will be scrapped as a result of this little accident. It will cost millions, many millions of dollars to remove this ship, to refloat it again, only to take it to another port in Italy and cut it up in pieces. Now what does this and how does this relate to health? You know, all of us, we want to have a happy and healthy life, don't we? How many of us want to have a happy and healthy life? We're on a journey. We were born for a purpose. We all have a goal, and I believe a destiny. But sometimes along the course of life, things happen. Sometimes they're very seemingly simple, small problems, which can result in tragedy and tragical outcomes. And the subject we want to look at today, we want to look at in a very simple manner. I'm not a cardiologist, so we're not going to get into the cardiology of this condition or the pharmacology of it or any of those other components, but we want to look at simple solutions to complex problems. Do you believe that for many things in life there are simple solutions to complex problems? I believe so. What would have been the simple solution to what became a complex problem here? Just don't navigate this ship so close to shore and you won't hit the rock and everything will be fine. But because of a wrong choice, a very sad and deadly and fatal outcome was realized. And so from this perspective, we want to look at heart disease as the number one killer in the Western world and see if there are some simple solutions that can be implemented into our lives that are manageable, that are reasonable, that are rational, that make sense, that will allow us to navigate beyond the disaster of heart disease. Do you believe there's such a thing? Is there such a solution? Or do you think we need complex pharmacology or invasive uh, uh, cardiology, cardiac surgeries that do uh, uh, angioplasty and, and put in stints? Are those solutions or are they nothing more than uh, a band-aid or a, a secondary approach to a problem that is really preventable? I believe we can do things that will help us. Now, there are maybe some sites, I don't know how long all of you have been in the Vancouver area, but I remember something in Vancouver. It was a happy day. I'm not a, I'm not a hockey fan. But didn't you have here just in, in 2011 the Stanley Cup Finals? Stanley Cup Finals in Vancouver, 2011. Does anyone remember? Okay. Those were the pictures that were out on the media as a consequence of what was supposed to be a wonderful event. The Stanley Cup in Vancouver. The game was with the Boston Bruins. 
and it was game number seven. And what did Vancouver want to do? They were going to win. And when they didn't win, this is how things got. Things got very ugly. These are the, the, the pictures that I saw about Vancouver. Not pretty pictures. But now what does the picture of heart disease look like? What does it look like? I don't think it's a person exercise, by and large. Would you agree with me? It looks very, very different, the portrait of heart disease. It looks more like what took place in March, was it March 11th of 2011? The, do you recall the sights that we got from the tsunami that hit Japan and the consequence of the meltdown of nuclear reactors? Do you remember that? These things stay in our minds. Something went wrong. Something unexpected. Something nobody planned. And that's how a heart attack is. That's how heart disease is. It is silent. It is imperceptible. But when it hits, it's deadly. There's no preparation. There is no uh, real warnings or signs for most cases. When it happens, this is what things look like going to the emergency room. Kind of like that nuclear reactor. An atomic meltdown. Fires. And then the remains of the damage that was done. And even though it seemed complex, and for those of you who followed it, it was really a very simple problem. What was the problem? with this nuclear plant at Dachi. What was the problem? The problem was the cooling system didn't work. You have here the, and we're not going to get into, into the generation of power on the basis of, of nuclear energy, but we want to look at it because that's kind of how the heart works. Something very complex happens when something very simple stops working. Now this is what happened. You have here the nuclear reactors that give off tremendous heat. They bring this water into the form of steam. The steam then drives the turbines. And then that steam is recooled back down into water by water that comes from the ocean. That is a little bit of a cooling system. And the water is recycled and the system continues. So it's a steam generated. Uh, electricity as a consequence of a nuclear reactor. Now what went wrong is the cooling system stopped working. The plant, this just kept heating up, heating up, heating up, temperature rising, temperature rising, and this cooling thing no longer worked. What happened? A meltdown. A meltdown took place. A dysfunction of that entire system. Now for us, as it relates to health care, if we want to change something with regards to heart disease, and I believe there's hope for us, we can change something about heart disease. It does not have to be a number one killer. By the way, in Canada, it fell down to second place. You know what's in first place? America's, uh, uh, Canada's number one killer? Any guesses? Cancer. Cancer beat heart disease in Canada. In the US and most of the other developed world, heart disease is still number one. But for us to have hope, there needs to come change. Something has to be done different. And I'd like to suggest to you this afternoon that, you know, what we really need is not necessarily more information, but what do we really need? Because many of us already know what I'm going to be sharing with you today. We know what we need to do. You've been to the health lectures here all along, right? How many have been to some of the previous health lectures? Yes, you've heard a lot of good things from a health perspective. What do we really need to do with the information? We need to apply it. Okay? For us to have hope, something has to change. It's very, very important. If we don't make application to information, then what is it? It's just information. I'd like to challenge you today that whatever you hear in these lectures, 
When you are impressed with the fact that there's something in my life that I need to change, that you decide right here, right now, I'm going to apply this information to my life, to my lifestyle, so that there is hope for me in a different and in a better way. I'd like to challenge you to that, to make a change, to make a decision that I'm going to implement certain principles, certain lifestyle choices. And as I apply those, I will reap the benefits. Because just coming here and listening to a lecture and say, oh, that's good information. Yeah, I knew that already. Yeah, I really should do that, but, but, you know, my grandfather had heart disease, and my great-grandfather, and my uncle has it, and these and other. Since when should our biology be controlled by our biography? Let's not make any excuses. Make a decision right now. I am not going to make excuses for not bringing about change in my life. Alexander Allan Poe said, an excuse is worse than a lie. Is worse than a lie. Don't lie to yourself. Don't say, well, I'm getting too old to do that. You are younger right now than you'll ever be. Did you know that? You're not getting any younger. You're only getting older. So you're not getting any younger. So if you're going to do it, do it now. Because you're not going to get younger. Don't look at what happened to your forefathers because we don't want to let you know, the biography change our biology. Let's not do that. Have the courage. Don't think, well, you know what? I don't have the courage. I'm not going to eat the plum because I don't want to shake the tree. It's sad. Shake the tree and eat the plum. Let them fall down and reap the benefits of a changed life. There is hope when we make change. I think there's nothing so futile as expecting something different when you keep doing, finish the sentence, the same thing over again. If you keep doing the same thing, what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing will happen. Nothing will change. So if you want to have change happen, don't do the same thing over and over again. And we'll share with you simple principles that you already know and have already heard that will bring about change in our life. Do you like spending money at the doctor's office? Now in America we have green ones. Yours are colorful here. You have colorful money. But you don't like spending that, do you? You just go to the doctor's office and say, oh, I just come in here to bring you a few hundred dollar bills. I figured you needed it. No, we don't like doing that. Applying lifestyle choices is money saving. How many would agree with that? As you make lifestyle choices in your life, you don't have to go to the doctor as often. Or maybe not at all for certain things because you've prevented. An ounce of prevention is worth a, help me, a pound of cure. A pound of cure. See, this is, these are some of the health uh, costs statistics that we see as part of the GDP. They're rising. People are spending more and what? Getting less. People are spending more and they're still dying as a consequence of that. And in Canada, I understand it costs you money too. Health care is not free, is it? It comes from somewhere. Somebody is paying for health care. So it costs money when you go to the doctor. It costs money when you go to the hospital. And on top of that, I have noticed that in Canada, when you have a problem, it takes not only money, but what does it take according to this chart here? Time. I was amazed when I looked at some of the government health care statistics for Canada. See, in the U.S., if I want an MRI or CT scan, I can get it that same day. I just call up, make an appointment, patient goes in, gets his CT scan or an MRI. I understand, according to the statistics, 73 days for a CT scan, MRI, 112. If you want a hip replacement, these are average statistics. You can go on, on, on the sites and, and read these. 210 days. For a knee replacement, you're almost going to wait a year. Now, wouldn't it be great if we wouldn't have to wait because we don't need it? You like that. No waiting because I don't need it. And no money spent because I don't need it. That'd be great. So it saves time 
and it saves money. Now let's look at the percentages of cardiovascular deaths as it relates to different places in the world. You'll notice that which place in the world is this, from a percentage perspective, very unlikely to be a problem? Africa. Africa has us beat, has Europe beat, has most of the world beat, only 10 to 20 percent. See, we fall into this category right in here. This is what percent of cardiovascular deaths are in relation to the population. We have only one area in the world, one larger geographic area that surpasses us, and that's Eastern Europe, where it's 50 to 62 percent. Now, bringing it again back down to Canada, one in four Canadians will contract some form of heart disease. So if we're going down the row here, you can just count one out of every four, according to the statistics, will contract heart disease. And 75,000 Canadians suffer heart attacks each year. Is that a lot of people? That's a lot of people that no longer are with us on an annual basis. Loved ones, friends, husband, wives, grandparents that could be here but are not here because they were ravaged from us by heart disease. Look at the cost to the, to the economy, $19 billion, a lot of money spent. And then another thing, you may say, oh, I'm, I'm still young. One in two heart attack victims is under the age of 65. So it's not a respecter always of persons and of, of age. And then sometimes we think, well, I'm a female. Oh, it only happens to men. No, it happens to women too. Men, women. Then we think old people. No, it happens to young people. And then on top of that, it happens 45% of the time is people under the age of 65. So we need to take this very serious. Make changes in our life, lifestyle choices that will prevent us from contracting heart disease. And 5% of heart attacks strike young people under the age of 40. So that's quite a few of you people here today. Here we can see some other statistics between uh, the sexes and the age. And then we might wonder, well, you know, we never read about it in the newspaper. It's not something we hear about. It's, it doesn't make headline news. Yes, it costs billions. It takes away 75,000 out of our country every year. We never read about it. You know why that is? I believe it's because we have accepted the condition just as a norm. We've just accepted that that's the way it is. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. We do not have to be a statistic. When it happens, as I shared with you, unexpectedly, suddenly, without warning, it has serious impact. And as we shared, it covers the entire world. 12 million people die every year as a result of heart problems. Half of them could be saved by some very simple simple solutions by some very simple preventative programs. Half of them. Can you imagine if we could take that number 12 million and just bring it down to 6 million by just doing some very simple things? Things that don't cost. It's not something you have to buy. A pill or a product. It's just changing your lifestyle. Something you can do that's very affordable. Heart attacks are preventable. And if we take more stringent preventative measures, there are many scientific studies show that 9 out of 10, not 50%, 50% is just doing some simple basic things, but 9 out of 10 heart attacks could be prevented. Can you imagine that? 90% of this problem could be managed and controlled by some very, very simple basic cost-effective uh, measures. So what causes a heart attack? Well, 
it's, it's actually quite a simple problem. Remember that nuclear meltdown? The problem was the cooling system failed. So when the cooling system failed, the reactor overheated and melted down. In a heart attack, a very simple thing takes place. There are clinical phases and preclinical phases, and we don't want to get into the whole physiology of it. But this here is, is preclinical. There, there's no symptoms. Nobody knows it's happening, and it starts very early on in life. We have the normal artery. Then we have a little bit of a fatty streak building up. Then we have a fibrous plaque developing, and then the advanced, a little bit more placking developing. And then we, only then, when it's gotten really bad, look at this, this is still preclinical. When we get to this area here, do we have certain symptoms? Now, various things can happen. One thing can happen can be aneurysm. All right, where there's a rupture in the blood vessel because the blood vessel loses its elasticity. It becomes calcific, it becomes brittle, it becomes very fragile, and as a consequence, uh, an aneurysm takes place. And by the way, when an aneurysm happens, it's usually fatal unless you are really close to a hospital because it's usually a large blood vessel. And when that ruptures, it's, it's too late unless you're in the hospital and you're immediately rushed into surgery and the, the uh, artery is repaired. You can have occlusive thrombosis or you can have uh, stenosis taking place. Now let's look a little bit at the physiology of what happens. A blood vessel, arteries and veins, but we're talking primarily about arteries, have different layers. Okay? The, the tunica intima is almost like saran wrap. It's very thin and it's extremely slippery. It's made to reduce friction and to allow the blood cells to, to slide through the blood vessels with the least amount of energy loss. What primarily causes or the seed of heart disease is damage to the tunica intima. A rupture or a tear takes place, which is depicted here, slight injury. It could be any one of these things here. We're going to touch on some of them. Notice smoking. Uh, hypertension, viruses, toxins, elevated homocysteine, and, and just a number of other things. But generally, inflammation, the state of inflammation in the body or in the circulatory system causes a, a, a damage or a slight abrasion to the, to the tunica uh, intima. When that takes place, the next progression here is actually the invagination of endothelial and monocytes and platelets into the, the, just below the lining of the tunica intima. And as a consequence, that grows and develops as you see here in slide number three. You actually have muscle tissue starting to develop in here. You've got lymphocytes, you've got all of these things taking place. And actually the buildup is not inside the blood vessel, it's between the layers between the layers as a consequence of damage. As that builds up here, look at we have all kinds of things building up here. Smooth, mu smooth mu muscles, lymphocytes. It's not all about cholesterol. Did you see that? It's not all about fat. It's about damage and then a, a faulty repair process. All kinds of other materials building up here. Lymphocytes, uh, smooth muscle, and then of course some lipid material only in the later stages of the condition. And as that builds up, see between these layers, between here and here, the blood vessel is narrowing. So here we see the blood vessel on a cutaway. What's impressive here? Age 21. 21. We're going to share with you another statistic that this problem begins in teenagers. This is not a problem of old people. This is a problem that begins very young. See, at 21, we already see the fatty streak. Then by the age of 51, look what, look what that looks like. Are there people in here over 51? I think so. I think so. 51. 58. 60. The progression of the disease. Now, Let's look a little bit more at the anatomy of the heart and see what makes this simple problem 
so devastating and so deadly. We have blood vessels that supply the muscle of the heart. The heart does not get the blood from the blood that's going through the heart. The, blood has, the, the heart has its own independent blood supply to keep it nourished and to keep it oxygenated and to bring in nutrition. And this blood vessel right here is the most critical, the left coronary artery, because it supplies this part of the heart. And do you know what that part of the heart is? That's the left ventricle. Okay? The heart is kind of like a four-cylinder engine. It's got two atria and two ventricles. The atria, the only thing they do is pump blood down into the ventricles. The right ventricle pumps blood through the lungs for oxygenation. And the left ventricle, only that one cylinder, the left ventricle, pumps blood into the rest of your body. So guess what happens when the left ventricle doesn't work? So usually you've got an eight-cylinder engine. If you've got one spark plug not working, the car runs. But in this case, if the left ventricle doesn't work, what happens? There's no blood for you. And when there's no blood for you, what happens to you? Serious things. You can die. It can be fatal unless something can be done immediately. So this left coronary artery, if any obstructions occur in here, they can be fatal. Now, if the obstructions occur higher up, guess what it does? We'll be seeing in subsequent slides. It kills everything down below that. That would be a cutaway of a blood vessel. A blood vessel which very early on, showing that thickening of those layers because of buildup and then clogging occurring, kind of like an old pipe. Have you ever seen an old pipe? And the inside of it is all corroded and distorted and lime buildup and maybe rust and so forth. And that's how the blood vessel of the heart is. So if we have an obstruction occurring in this area, then everything distal from this obstruction becomes anoxic, becomes ischemic, and then dies because it's like being choked. No oxygen, no blood supply. So this is how the, the heart works. This would be the four-cylinder engine. See, we got the two atria up here. We got the right ventricle, and we have the left ventricle. And then we have a very interesting wiring system we have two nodes that initiate the electrical charge. Your heart uh, fires as a consequence of electrical activity, myocardial electrical activity. That is initiated by the SA node and the AV node, goes down the bundle of Hiss. And then the fibers are all triggered to fire at the right time so that the timing is just right, just like it would be in an automobile. Now, if, if there are damage to these areas in here, then we can't have proper electrical conductivity. So that can be a problem, the electrical activity. Or it could be a plumbing problem, a blockage of the blood vessels to where the heart muscle doesn't receive the nutrition. So we can have problems in, in different areas. Now, this problem, when it affects the heart, we call it coronary heart disease. But this problem affects actually the whole body. It's not a heart problem, it's a body problem. It's just when that problem is in the heart, then we get all scared because then that can kill you. But when that same problem that we're talking about, see, simple problems cause complex problems throughout the body. And the solutions for the heart, the brain, the kidney, the liver, wherever it is, is all the same. The same approach, the same solution, different problem, different location. If it occurs in the brain, what do we call it? A stroke. See, there's only two types of strokes. Ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke. Guess which one is the most common, about 80% of all stroke? Is it hemorrhagic or ischemic? What do you think? Ischemic. It's not a matter of a blow to the head where blood is leaking out or you got a hematoma, subdural hematoma. The problem is ischemia. The blood supply is cut off. The same problem to the brain as to the heart. Then if it occurs uh, in other areas, we have aneurysms, we have angina, we have hypertension because we have blockage in the kidneys. So blood is being blocked, it, it, it can't move through, so pressure builds up. We have it in the peripheral vessels, anywhere throughout the body, that same problems. Now here's how it would look if we 
did it histologically. If we cut a blood vessel, cut it in half, stain it, these are the things we would see as a consequence of the disease. Remember we talked about the, the clinical phase of aneurysm. This is what an aneurysm looks like. This is a, uh, a dissected aneurysm. It's a large bulging of the blood vessel. Doesn't look very pretty. There it is. Hemorrhaged. And, and sometimes these can be picked up on scans, but you don't see them if you don't check for them. And once they break, uh, it's a serious problem. Now, it's interesting to note that people that we said live in other places of the world that eat these kinds of foods, you know, just real simple stuff. These kind of people, do you think they have this problem? No, they don't have this problem. But yet people who live in the Western world, in our world, in Canada, in Vancouver, one out of six, even as teenagers, have the beginning of coronary heart disease. One out of six. By the age of 40, 70% of everybody has it, to the point of, if you remember on the pictures, you have already 50% occlusion and the consequence is a heart attack. Let's look again at the heart attack. This is what it looks like. You have a blockage of the, the left lateral ventricular artery. It becomes blocked, and then all of that muscle tissue that is supplied by that artery now slowly dies. What does a heart attack feel like? Pressure on the chest, like an elephant maybe sitting on you. Deep pressure. Sometimes there can be symptoms into the neck, symptoms into the left arm. They can be different symptoms, but primarily constrictive pressure in the chest area. And the sad thing is that out of those who survive a heart attack, two-thirds of them are permanently disabled. So having a heart attack is not a good day. If you survive, two-thirds chance you will be disabled. So who's at risk? When you look at these people here, I said in Canada it's about one in four. Which one of these people are at risk? Is there something we know today that has been sub substantiated by numerous research studies that tells us that you are more or less at risk. Let's look at what those things are. The big three. Number one, smoking. Smoking contributes to 30%, it is felt, of all coronary heart disease. Number two, high blood pressure contributes to coronary heart disease. As a matter of fact, if you raise your blood pressure just by 10 millimeters of mercury, you increase your chances of a heart attack by 23%. So it's important to keep your blood pressure down. Do you know what your blood pressure is? How many people know what their blood pressure is? Raise your hand. Good. I think everybody should know that. There are certain things we should know about ourselves. We know our street address. We know, the, you know how many gigabytes our computer has. We know about our cell phone, how many minutes it runs. We, we, we know all these things. But we need to know and have information about ourself. We need to know about our blood pressure. And where does our blood pressure need to be? Can somebody tell me where we need to stay under? Huh? How about 140 millimeters of mercury over 90? We need to stay below those numbers to be healthy. We can't come close to them or exceed them. So blood pressure. And number three, high cholesterol. Elevated cholesterol contributes to coronary heart disease more than any of these other conditions. So let's look at this a little bit. This is Canada. These are Canadian statistics. You can go on governmental uh, health care websites and all of these statistics are there. And I want to share with you that things are not getting better. Things are not getting better. Things are getting worse. And I'm not saying this to scare you, but I'm saying this because it's a fact. 
There are four things listed here, and only one out of four is getting better in Canada. And you know, in the States, we're no better. Actually, we're worse than the United States. I'll share with you some statistics from the U.S. that make you folks look real good. But I don't want to make you feel too good because then maybe you're not going to want to change. And I want you to decide today to make choices, lifestyle choices, that will result in health and happiness to where you are not a statistic, but you defy the statistics of the government because you're making choices that are simple and that are health promoting. Hypertension, let's just look at hypertension. We've got studies there from 94 all the way to 2005. In 94, hypertension was 8.2, and there's a p-value in there for error. I mean, these were good studies. And we see that hypertension from 8.2 has gone up to, in 2005, to 14.6. So that risk factor, which we said these risk factors uh, determine whether you will be at greater risk for coronary heart disease. Those are statistical factors. Hypertension is getting... What is it getting, better or worse? It's getting worse. Okay. Number two, diabetes. 2.5 and has gone now to, in, in 2005, and we're now 2012. You know, they're late with coming out with statistics. It takes them too long to study this. But I'll tell you, in 2012, the numbers are higher. It's gone up to 3.6. There's only one thing that got better, and what is that? Smoking. 24.4 and now down to 18.2. So good for you. Smoking has decreased. But look at obesity. That risk factor from a 9.5 has gone up to 11. Huh? It's gone up to. It's growing. People are getting heavier. People are having problems with sugar metabolism. People are having problems with hypertension. There we can see a little bit the wonderful statistic on smoking, how it's coming down. See, you got us beat. We were better than you back here, huh? back in the good old 90s. Canada was not beating the United States, but then you made some choices. Look at that. And you beat us right down here. Much better than us in America. Now, oh, it came close here, came close. US went a little up, Canada's still going down. Good for you. How about if we could see that in all of those other statistics? Wouldn't that be great? If we saw these Four statistical areas, these other areas, all show a reduction. What would be the outcome? Less heart attacks. Less death. 